Hello, I'm Martha Stanley, and this videotape documents a process I worked out for being able to weave four salvage textiles on floor looms like the ones we generally work on. Let me explain first what the term for salvage means. If you think of any piece of cloth that you've woven, as the weft comes out at the edge of that cloth, it turns 180 degrees and enters back into the cloth, making a nice embrace along the selvage as it does that. All right, in a four selvage textile, the warp threads are not cut at either end, but the warp is woven to its complete end, um, to the end of its length, which means that it turns and comes back into the textile at either to at top and bottom of the cloth, and hence the term for selvage. It's a very interesting process. It's um, been woven in um, our Southwest, in Central America, and in South America. And that's really um, where it started and where it has been. Um, now, I'd like to show you um, several ethnic textiles woven in this tradition. And I'd like to explain just very briefly, showing you the backstrap loom here, um, how some of the, the mechanical points are executed on a backstrap or um, a vertical loom like the Navajo use. All right. Um, if we think about any loom that has a heddle bar and a shed rod for creating the sheds, then this principle will apply. You can weave the cloth for any distance you choose from one end, and you then can take and turn either turn, move the weaver to the other end or turn the warp around, take the shed rod and move it to the other side of the heddles and move the heddles along the warp as you need and weave so that you have woven some at the one end of the warp and you then weave at the other end of the warp. And generally, in the weaving traditions that have done for salvage, that happens. And the meeting point, whether it be near one end of the cloth or somewhere in the middle, the, this meeting point is called the termination point. And um, it helps us to appreciate where the weaving ended, where the skill of the weaver is in that process, and also what happened to the space along the warp, and how, um, how that expresses the design, that limitation of a, an absolutely finite warp length. All right, the first piece that I want to show you is from the Andes. It's a warp face piece, um, and it's woven in two strips with a join here in the middle. Um, one end of the warp, the other end of the warp, and the termination point. Now, when you're doing pickup, as is the case here, it becomes very difficult as there is a shorter and shorter area of unwoven warp to get the sheds in. It becomes more and more difficult to do the pickup. Hence, in the termination area, you lose the design altogether. So that on this half, this is the termination area. On the other half, the termination area is at the other end of the cloth. It's quite handsome, I think. And there's always a different kind of energy in a four selfish piece. I'll talk more about that later. Now let me show you this man's shoulder bag from Guatemala, made of maguey fiber. Um, this is a warp which was about that long. You see these, this has been sewn up and about out to here at this end. And it was woven for a distance in at the one end. The loom turned around, as I just explained, woven from the other end to about this point. And then the unwoven area in the central had the heddles and shed rod m removed from it, and it was sprang um, practices, this braiding and interlacement was performed. And then there is a cord across here to keep all the um, 
the interlacement in, because if this cord came out, then um, it would unweave back to where the loom weaving went on. The poncho that I have on, actually this is not a poncho, it's called a weepeel, it's from Guatemala, and it also is done in two pieces, which I've woven, which, I've, which I am wearing, um, one piece on the front and one on the back, rather than in the other direction as they would wear it. And the termination point in Guatemala is not woven as tightly. Their cloth usually is a very balanced weave, and perhaps you can see the termination area here and the looser weave that's part of it. It's nice, isn't it? This old Navajo chief's blanket. Now, in weft-faced weaving, um, the, the challenges are different, weaving for selvage, in that there is a great deal of freedom to change the design during the weaving process, much more so than in the um, real uh, limitation of warp face. Um, and so as the weaving progresses and as the design weaves itself into the cloth, there's always this question about how the space um, of the actual weaving fits in with what's left to weave. This is the termination area of this textile. It's an area that's reasonably easy to weave in the sense that there are not a lot of color changes and areas of detailed weaving going on when the sheds are small and the space is very limited for making the sheds. I sense sometimes in four selvage textiles a different energy than I do in the textiles which we cut off of our looms with a remnant of warp left on. Uh, and it seems to me perhaps that in the process of weaving there's a certain energy in the weaver in the action of, of the weaving process and in the textile. And if that textile is cut off the loom and separated from the remainder of warp, I've, I've come to feel that the energy stays in the remaining warp. When the warp is woven in its entirety and comes off the loom as a whole piece, somehow, at least some of the time, the energy is in that textile, and that's very interesting. Now I'm going to show you some diagrams which simply point out the key features of the process we're documenting here in the video. These drawings may help you to spot and understand a little bit better the points in the process as we come to them. This indicates that a warp is made which is the full width and the full exact length that the textile is going to be, and that a cross is made during the process of warping. Once this is done, um, the threads are tensioned so that there is as uniform tension as possible from one to the next. To maintain that tension and to help space the warp, um, twining is worked across the beginning. This end of the warp now with the twining is going to be at the breast beam. And in order for the weft to be able to weave right up to the end of the warp loops, right next to the twining, we don't want anything in the way of a rod inside the warp here. We consequently take and wrap very tightly, and this is shown in expanded form, wrap very tightly the twining and warp loop to a rod which is going to be outside the warp. And the next diagram here shows that in its tight position. It also indicates that the cross has been uh, maintained with, here with um, cord. And it also indicates that these are forming warp loops at the other end after the rod has been taken out here, the warping beam or rod.
This shows moving the warp and its tie rod with the cross to the loom arrangement. If there is a reed, and it's not shown here, the reed would be in this position. The warp loops would be threaded through the reed, through the appropriate heddle on the appropriate harness, and then slipped onto a rod back behind the heddles here. Weaving begins. And at some point in the weaving process, this rod gets quite close to the heddles from behind as the cloth has advanced around the breast beam. And the sheds begin to be compromised. At that point in time, we need to find some way of extending the tensioning on the warp threads back here even though the warp itself will not be lengthened. And so we use what I call dupes, which are long loops of cord, all the same length, and they're inserted one through each loop of the regular warp, and then stuck on a rod, which is up here at this point. This is the first dupe inserted. And this shows all the dupes through all the warp loops. The tension is now on this rod that's through the dupes. And the rod that was through the end of the warp loops has now been removed. Weaving continues. And when we get within something like an eighth of an inch of the end of these warp loops, weaving with loom-controlled sheds stops. Now, I need to review something here for you. And that is that in the ethnic process, the warp is heddled individually so that there is one warp thread per warp channel. And the implication of that for our purposes here is that both at the bottom and at the top, in other words, both at the beginning and at the finish of the cloth, the weft, the last weft row is locked within a warp loop. You see it there and down at the beginning. That's the ethnic method. Now, because I have put a warp loop through a heddle, a doubled warp, my warp still locks the weft in at the beginning. But you can see at the end that these loops could pull right out through the warp tunnels in the cloth and, uh, in a sense, unravel the cloth. Consequently, what I do at the end in these eighth of an inch or so warp loops remaining is to thread the weft on a needle and needle weave it. And the reason I needle weave it is because in the process, I am repairing the original pairs so that the right hand half of the first warp loop pairs with the left hand half of the second warp loop. And consequently, that weft is locked in the warp loops. I'll show you in the next diagram the loops pretty much all filled with weft. And you might also notice here where the um, rep line sh shifts over a half step. Because the weft packs down, it pretty well covers this little shift here where the needle weaving began. And then as a final touch, we twine across. And this time, we must use needles through the threads which are twining, because there is not enough space left in the filled warp loops to accommodate really anything more than a needle. That summarizes the process. And I think it will be much easier to understand, understand as we go through it, and you can see it uh, in actuality. <laughs>
let's move now from the diagrams and the notions about this to the practical application and is true of any weaving process. There's an evolutionary aspect. These are the way I do these things now, but they change any time I gain insight into uh, a quicker, better, um, more elegant, whatever way of doing it. I'm always changing the way I do it in order to see if I can get it better. Um, let me show you the warping setup. These happen to be two old picnic benches raised up on cinder blocks so that the height for, war for warping and working is a little more uh, comfortable. They um, have fastened to them uh, large C clamps. Let me show you one. C clamp is about that size. It's a very heavy steel rather than aluminum. And instead of just fastening it to the table or the board, um, I'm propping it up from the, the screw part of it up from the board with a block of wood and on top of it a metal plate so that I get a nice shaped nook here to hold the tube. And I'm going now to just hold the beam in place with a bungee cord. These beams happen to be off of my glomocra loom. They come off very readily, and I borrow them most of the time when I warp uh, for four salvage. Uh, I like them because they are round and slick, um, and because they don't bow. Now, uh, I've placed the beams arbitrarily at this distance. Uh, I want to refine that a little more because what I've, what I've discovered is it's tricky to simply measure a distance with a ruler or steel tape um, between these um, beams for the warp length. What I prefer to do is to make from linen two loops which are the same length as each other and which are the length of the warp I want to make. Um, in other words, if I'm making a rug three feet long, the cord in each of these loops is perhaps six feet four inches or six feet six inches. A little room to tie the knot, but um, twice the three foot length. And then I'm going to take that loop and getting tangled here put it on the beam at one end and figurating it, putting it on the other one. And the same story over here on this side, figurating it and putting it on the back. Now, what I'll do is move this back beam to get tautness on each of these loops and um, to get about the same degree of tautness on each. So I'm moving them back, kind of leaning into them and fastening down. And I'll do the same here, leaning into it to get it back. Now, I can test the tautness very well when we're dealing with the kind of tautness that we do in rugs by strumming on the cord and listening to the tone that it makes. See, there's quite a difference in tone there between the two. Let me change these a little bit. We're not trying for sameness here. But I want things to have a certain uh, similarity for tension purposes. Now, let me say a word about uh, the warp that I'm going to be using. It's a white wool. They're 700 yards per pound. Uh, it's four ply with a lot of spin, and the fiber length is about that long. It's a yarn called a belting yarn, 
Um, it's from England, made by a company uh, named the Mel Multiple Fabric Company, and um, it is spun in order to weave conveyor belts. It's very durable, very strong. Uh, it also has that wonderful property which we really need to think about in for salvage weaving, and that is it has a certain amount of elasticity, not nearly as much as cotton, but it has the forgiveness that linen wouldn't allow us. And since in for salvage weaving, once you begin weaving, you can't uh, readjust the tension on the warp, um, it helps uh, accommodate the, the weakness we have in getting really good tension. Uh, I'm going to begin warping with this, but I want to show you this little device first. Uh, this happens to be PVC pipe, and it's of a diameter so that it fits quite cleanly down through the shaft, uh, the tube of warp yarn, and the warp wheel feed off it very nicely. There's some length here at the back end for me to hold on to, and um, the, the, the uh, tube of, of warp is prevented from sliding off the front by a plastic champagne cork. Uh, I suppose that um, sparkling cider bottle would supply the same shaped piece. Now, rather than show you the knot that I will tie to begin um, with this finer warp thread, I'm going to show it to you um, slowly enough, I hope, with a much fatter, smooth cord. Um, it's, it starts out, in terms of just learning the knot, it's like making a slip knot where the slipping side I is the cut or short end rather than the long end. And we get that to slip, and actually we want a generous loop, and we also want a generous tail. We then take the tail and make with it a half hitch, which we don't pull all the way through, but only as a loop. Now what that does is lock the, the knot, the loop, but it also easily unties for adjustment down the way when we tension, when we really adjust the tension on the warp. It's called a loom harness knot if um, this no, does not remain as a loop, but, but this tail gets pulled all the way through. I don't know what kind of a name it might have this way. It's in Ashley's Book of Knots as a loom harness knot. All right. Now, to make it around the fixed beam, I need to work just a little differently. I do it by making an overhand knot way down the warp two or three feet. Bring the short end around the beam through this large overhand knot, leaving both a generous loop and a generous tail. Tighten it down. Probably have a foot of slack either side of where this overhand knot is. And then tighten it, OK, so that the loop will not slip. All right, now that knot is positioned about a foot from the beam which it's around. I'm going to begin warping. This now, to orient us, this is going to be one side selvage of my rug. Uh, I mean, the, this will be the selvage warp at this side. And I will be warping toward me in figure eight fashion. At first, I'm just very casually spacing the warp. And as soon as I have a couple of inches wound off, then I will measure it, start counting, and um, make sure that I've got a good sense for how these threads need to lie next to each other. I'm paying little attention here to the warp tension. I'm paying more attention to just setting up a rhythm and beginning to get a feel for how far apart these threads ought to be. I'm working with a set of six 
working ends per inch or six heddles per inch, but a double strand or loop in the heddle. You see, there's the loop and the doubled strand which it forms. Um, and I will have six of those to the inch. Now I'm going to stop, set this down. Please note, if I set it down with the yarn feeding off the underside of it, if it rolls in the one direction, it will only slightly tighten the warp. If it rolls in the other direction, it will not loosen it. It's important to get it that way. Now I'm going to take just a pair of cords that's bicolored, happens to be white and coral. And I'm just going to put these, twining them around each other every two inches to serve as counters for the amount of warp that I've woven. Three, six, nine, 12. All right, if I have six loops per inch, I have 12 in two inches. And so there's my first two inches. I want to check the spacing of this by measuring to see that that's two inches wide. And it just about is. We'll adjust it a little bit at this end. And we'll also adjust it at the other end. And this is spaced much further apart. It's important that on each beam, the warp gets spaced the same amount. Because otherwise, threads are going to be longer that, that have to, uh, on the beam that's, that has the warp spread wider apart. OK. And we'll move on. I'm just going to continue working on this now. And we will follow my progress from time to time on the warping. Now, one of the things you may be beginning to get a sense of here is that this is not the kind of abstraction that we have when we warp um, on a warping board, where we're compacting the warp into a small, dense space, and then it will be spread out on the loom. Here, actually, as we warp, we're beginning to get a sensitivity for the size of the finished piece. And I think that's very helpful, because uh, once we get that warp made, the size of the finished piece doesn't change from what that warp is. And so it will need in that finished piece to reflect whatever design we put into it and to deal with the space that it is. And of course, whatever notion you have on paper for um, design within that space uh, does not necessarily weave to the design, uh, to the design in the cloth does not necessarily take the same space that it does on paper. And so ultimately, it's not the warp that accommodates the design, but rather the design which has to accommodate the warp. And that becomes very interesting. Sometimes within a tube, there will be a knot, or one runs out in the middle of the tube. And so one runs out of warp on the tube in the middle of the warping process and needs to make a join. And I want to demonstrate how I do that. So let me take and cut the warp. And we can pretend that whatever happened to cause these two threads to be separate and need to be joined. I want to show you a close up of this knot uh, using coarser, slicker uh, material to uh, demonstrate with. It's called the fisherman's knot. Um, you make it with each of the two overlapped ends. You make an overhand knot encompassing the other thread. All right, here's the other short end. Make it in an overhand knot. All right. Now, traditionally, the short ends 
You see how that collapses together like that? And it bites very well. It holds very well. Um, it's very good for a wiry cord or warp like the one I'm using. And in fact, I discovered it uh, on the tube of yarn from the spinner. Now what I do is to pull these two overhand knots together like that. They butt up against each other. They really don't slip, and it works very well. I leave the long lengths so that I will have plenty to overlap in the channel that the warp is running in in the cloth, and it makes for a very firm join. Um, when I get to that point in the weaving, I will take these knots out. I've just finished warping, I think, and checked my count of warp threads. So I'm going to set the warp down, cut down here, then come back and repeat the process that I did there. Uh, I'm going to move now and put the leaf sticks in the warp. I keep them store them inside this tube. And I'm simply putting them, running them in the warp on each side out near the beam so that I bisect the thread properly. Come over underneath again and finish placing them. Before I begin, uh, tensioning the warp, I'm just going to get a little feedback on how my beams have remained during the process of warping or how much they may have shifted. Uh, this is quite loose. That's still quite taut. Um, now what I'm going to do is go from thread to thread, putting a slight amount more tension on the warp than it has at the present time. And that means I will shift a little amount of thread all the way across with it gradually increasing so that I'll have more slack, presumably by the time I get to this side. Um, this is the point <clears throat> in the process where I really want no interruptions. I'm going to begin now and increase the tension a little bit If there's any question here about the order of the threads, I look to the cross in the middle and get the correct information. It's very important I keep up this rhythm.
Okay, we're back at the beginning. Now what I want to do is to hold this taut, the warp, while I readjust the knot so that I get the correct tension there. And then what I'll do is go back across the warp again. And I may do that two or three times until I feel really quite um, believing of the tension that I have. The more quickly I can do it without fumbling, without mistakenly taking the, the threads out of order, um, without gross lengths of threads being moved along, the, the easier and the more con the easier it is and the more confident I am. This feels good. I can more or less run my hand across it and not be dismayed. Um, what I'll do now is start at the, on the beginning edge and work my way over here again and then perhaps back. And I generally do this three times, maybe four times. Uh, until I feel comfortable about what I'm going to be living with. We're going to move now to the twining segment of this process. Um, let me explain what I've done here in terms of threads. Um, I've made a short warp of six ends. Um, the ends are 14 feet long, and that's enough to go around the perimeter of the rug with a bit left over for loom waste um, and uh, for general ease and working with it. And there will be some take up in the process of doing the twining. Now, some of this I'm going to show you in detail. And some of it I'm going to refer you to a rug weaver's source book. One of the appendices is on card woven salvages. I'm twining across as if these were weft twiners at the beginning edge of the rug, um, that which will face the breast beam here. Um, then I'll be threading it on cards. And during the process of weaving the rug, I'll be weaving card woven selvages going up the edge and then twining again across at the far end after we've completed the weaving process. So what I'm going to show you now is the twining that occurs, the weft twining that occurs down at the beginning. And I say weft just because these threads at this point are, are functioning as weft threads. I've taken that 14-foot warp and um, halved it so that um, I'm working with the thread starting in just about the middle point. And I've made each of the six ends into a small butterfly. Now, I'm going to start at this edge and twine across. I'm placing the twining. Let me get three of these out of the way so we have less to tangle. I'm going to place the twining at the midway point of the steel beam here. And I'm going under one warp loop with each of the three weft butterflies. And just because of the way I pick them up and drop them, I'm getting what, in effect, is Z twining, Z direction twining. Now, I need to do this with care for two reasons. One is because if I mess much with the warp threads, my regular white warp here, I will ruin the tension. And I don't want to do that. Um, if I change the spacing much, it will change the width of my rug and the set of my rug. So what I'm really aiming for is to pretty well keep what I have and just handle it fairly delicately. When I tighten this thread, I just put my thumb on the regular warp to keep it from moving around. The reason that I'm putting in a second row is because I'm going to have two cards worth on either edge doing twining. And so if I want it to be the same all around the perimeter of the rug, uh, 
then it needs to be um, two rows here. The second row of twining is now also completed. I've separated um, the twiners into the, the three that make the top row, the three that make the bottom. Let me take one card and I'm going to take the thread which would be next to twine and put it through the card. I'm using six hole cards but filling every other hole. Now I have the cards oriented properly with respect to the warp so that I should produce a continuation of what I've had in the cloth. And let me see if I can show you that. Now we'll turn the cards a little bit here. And if we're lucky, Now we have the card woven selvage on this side, as we did on camera, and this side which we practiced on off camera beforehand. Huh. If we want it to be for selvage, we really want to weave clear up to the twining. And that means that we must fasten it to the loom beyond the warp. And that's why we're going to wrap it to a tie rod which has been moved from within the warp to beyond it. And that's the next thing we're going to be doing. When I first began doing this sort of thing, um, I would use a yardstick. That was clumsy. It took a longer period of time. And I kept reflecting on the notion of the Navajo spacing their warp, really, by the thickness of the twiners. Uh, in other words, by the size of the thread diameter itself, in a sense, by, by an internal relationship of threads. So um, at some point in the process, it occurred to me that it would be an interesting idea to wrap the tie rod with some kind of cord that naturally spaced itself at what my set was going to be. And uh, after play and um, lots of other confusing activity to the hardware salesman uh, in the hardware store, uh, I found cords that suited my needs. So I bought a good deal of it. And um, this is what I use generally for tie rods now. There are six wraps to the inch. If my set changes, then um, I change the size of the cord that I wrap with to fit the correct number of wraps of cord to the number of working uh, ends per inch. And I, I like the um, tidiness of that idea. Before I fasten the tie rod on the front here, let me just show what we're going to be doing. We're going to be taking and wrapping, putting a needle from the upper left to the lower right of each warp thread or loop. And we're going to put it right next to the steel beam so that it is behind both the twining and the warp loop. Now let me take and fasten this up here, centering it and sticking it right in front of the twining, like that. Don't worry about these loops. We'll be working with them later. <laughs> 
you can hear the wrapping thread slip in often in the groove like that, that little click. All right, um, we're finished putting this on the tie rod. This has taken us about uh, three hours to get to the point we are now. Um, and we're ready to take it off of the off tension on the uh, warping setup. Um, I'm going to begin by slipping these linen loops off. I've taken and fastened the cards and their clips together so that um, they don't hang on the warps and they won't get uh, unduly twisted and tangled. I'm going to take this beam out all together now. Just slip it out. These warps are quite stabilized at this point because they are wrapped so tightly to the tie rod. Now I'm simply going to take, bring the leash sticks up to the tie rod and take the large beam out, albeit with little grace. This may start looking more familiar as we get to the loom. The beams now are back in place on the loom, the ones we used for warping. I've taken the tie rod and fastened it just with bungee cords temporarily on it at the breast beam here, and I've got the leash sticks in front of the beater. Um, I'm going to first just start uh, threading and then let you see the process in this area, but it's probably going to be pretty familiar stuff to you. Uh, because it's for selvage, I need to have the warp come from the front, threading through to the back of the loom. Uh, and let me just review for you very quickly why that is. You see, I'm taking one of the loops of warp with the two threads in it and making it the working unit. They, the, the loops worth of two threads will come through the reed, through the heddle, and then um, the loop will go on to a rod back here. Um, now, what I want to think about in doing that is that I have as little twist as possible. This likes to twist around a bit because of the amount of spin in the thread. I want to have as little twist as possible so that if I don't pick the halfway point and one side has more slack than the other, that's no big problem to straighten out down the road. Um, I'm going to begin with the single strand at the edge, which is tied there with a long loop. And I want to start through the reed through the heddle and onto my bar. It's very important I not miss where things are in the cross and get threads out of order because I really can't, I can't correct that by changing things at the front. I have to correct it by redoing the threading All right, we're ready now to uh, attach the tie rod here to the loom cords. You see the two inch, the loop spaced every two inches here. I'm going to take one of them, wrap it around a couple of times, and slip it on a bar. And then I'm going to bring this that's the loom tie cord here at the front and put it on the same bar. You see that's what it looks like doing it this way. Let's move to the back. <laughs> 
This is what the warp looks like now. I'm going to take and fasten it to the back tie cords. And you see it's very easy using a double gate key like this. This is maybe called a double gate hook. Somehow I need to fiddle a little bit sometimes to feel a little more in control of things. But in a certain sense, the whole purpose of doing for salvage is not so much to put you in control of things, but it's to allow for a closer give and take between the cloth and you, the weaver. I'm going to uh, add some tension now. Uh, the card woven selvages are now tensioned off the back beam and positioned behind the reed, more or less in the area of the heddles. Uh, it packs in better if your first four shots, rather than being plain weave or whatever other weave you might be choosing to weave, um, are, are done in basket weave. In other words, over two working warps, under two working warps. Let me tell you why I'm doing what I'm doing here. First of all, I'm bubbling in a lot of weft. That's because the warp is going to be very compressed in the channel. The two threads working together in the heddle will, will be right tight on each other. But at first, as they come out of the twiners, they loop a bit. And there's a fatness there. And um, for the weft to pack gracefully around that, I need to have bubbled in a bit of extra weft. Second, it also is easier if I weave it in basket weave uh, rather than plain weave. Now, in addition to that, I'm beading with a rug fork. That's because this rug is going to be in wedge weave. And wedge weave is beaten with a fork or your hands, not with the looms beater, because the fell will always be on the, bi on the uh, bias or diagonal. Consequently, if I'm going to be beating with a, with a rug fork, such as this one, then it makes sense that I start working with it and work with it throughout, rather than um, change horses midstream, so to speak. You can see the rug is well underway now. Here we are behind the loom. Uh, 
what I'm, what I'm showing you now is the strategy for making these loops which, or, or dupes, which in effect are warp extenders. Um, the first thing that you'll need to do is to take and measure the distance between where you weave at the loom, beating comfortably so that it's close enough to you, back to where the tie rod can come behind the harnesses so you still get good sheds. That's what, what I would call the, the amount of loom waste that you have on the loom, all right? Um, I want to measure that, maybe add at least a few inches so that I'm not scrimping on it, multiply by four, um, add two or three extra inches, and that's the length of the cord I need to make one dupe. I take and hold it at its two ends and slip one of those ends through the next warp loop and slip them on a rod which will become the new tie rod. This is the way I store my working set of dupes. There are several hundred here. They're put on one going in this direction, the next one going in that direction, forming a cross in the middle. And I'll take them off in that order. I'm going to store them carefully here. And here. My new tie rod, I'm hooking through a loop here just to keep it suspended out there, and I'm putting it through there. What I do is take the next loop, put it through the appropriate warp loop, even the tension, and slip it on the dowel. Now, I want to make sure that I get keep my warp loops in order. And the easiest way to do that is just to glance back at the heddles and make sure that I don't have any threads crossing as I do it. Now, I've released the friction brake at the back so that I can handle this a little more readily. These loops in the warp ties now have the, this new tie rod going through them. And I'm going to take out the double gate hooks, which connect them. Now we'll see some fireworks here in a minute, as you can see. Okay. The dupes may shift around a little bit as I do this. Now first, I'm just going to bring this back and take a look at what I have. Tangle here. Okay, I'm going to center the tie rod a little more in these dupes. Now I'm going to take the bar out. And maybe already 
you can see what's happening along the line here as the threads are now under the control of the dupes rather than the bar. Take the bar out. Okay, before I weave any further, I'm going to take out the knot that was in one of the ends of my warps. All right, now the knot is out. I've th threaded this back through the dupe and forward again, so it is through heddle and reed. And I'm going to attach now something to it to extend it down so that I now can tie it at the beginning here and tension it. So the challenge for me at this point is not how to get the length of the rug to agree with where I want the design to finish, but to get the design to finish where the rug ends, which is where the loops are. M my question now is, is how to resolve the design of the rug so that it respects the integrity of the length of the rug. And in doing that, I can choose to try and camouflage the disparities that I'm dealing with, namely this one and a half inch length difference from left to right here in only two feet of width. Um, or I can somehow try to show it off in a way which is a little bit bolder uh, and is in keeping with the spirit of what I have going in it. And um, uh, my own personal notion is that any time I run into a difficulty, the cloth will be more successful if I try to rise to the occasion. And what I'm contemplating doing in this next bit of weaving is actually taking this lowest part in the turquoise area and building that up horizontally with a little bit of subtle stripe color changes, I think. But then I will have less disparity, and then I will continue on with a stripe going across this way in the wedge weave. Well, as you may be able to see, I'm just about done with the weaving. You can perhaps see the end of the loops with respect to the completion of the, of the loom-controlled part of the weaving. Now, up to this point, I've had absolutely no problem with my sheds. I simply step on the treadles and I get as good sheds as any of us could expect to get at any point. Now, let me just show you once again what I did here in filling in a bit. I wove along here on this band until about this point, and then I just carried my weft over and filled in here with some pretty much horizontal shots of the turquoise, and they take up that much area. And you can perhaps see that there are some color changes I'm trying now to keep about the same distance from the end of the loops with each shot. Now the whole purpose of the needle weaving really is not to be able to weave clear up to the end because I can do that just continuing the way I have been weaving. I need to have the weft locked in those loops and the best way to do that is not simply to twine across, but to add a little extra sturdiness by putting in several picks of, of the needle weaving where I take and repair the paired warps with a needle. And that's what I'm about to start doing now. I like using a needle like this really very much. It's bent so that I've got a little more leverage here in dealing with this flat plane. And it also has a fairly good sized eye, as I think you can see. And that means 
that when it gets good and tight in the loop, um, I, I can stop needle weaving. And when I do the twining across at the end and also use needles, they will be much smaller than this. And I know that there will be space for them. OK, I'm going to start. And the purpose always with this is to be going through the middle of the loop, not between loops. Now what I'm going to do, I'm near the end of this length. I like to end and join on the row closest to the regular weaving because that gets it the furthest from where the actual end of the rug is. I'm just going to work along here with the needle while I can. Need to continually make sure that I'm working enough extra weft in. If you're not mindful of that, you can have cloth that has one size. Oh, I think I need to go to the crochet hook now. You can have cloth that's one width for its regular weaving and then suddenly gathers in in the needle weaving area. I don't seem to have trouble anymore, but the first few times I did it, I had a lot of difficulty in how much extra weft I worked in in the needle weaving because you get an entirely different feel and feedback from the cloth about it. I should also say that when I first did it, I would go full span along each row. I'm stretching this loop a bit since it was so short. That one also can use a little stretching. I don't seem to have any compunction about uh, fiddling with that sort of thing at this point. Now we'll take our new length. I want to overlap a good distance. So I'm going in exactly the same way that I did with the short end. Now I'm going to go on at least a little bit beyond where the last fibers of the old strand finished off. I'll take it a little bit into the orange area here. OK, now I'm going to come back and pull this along because I don't want extra bulkiness. I just want good overlap. And need to make sure that I've left enough extra weft. OK, now I'm going to turn and start going back. Now you see I need to be getting the opposite shed from what I had. I want to make sure I have enough twist in the yarn, and I may have to keep adding that as I go. 
I needed to turn that loop so that it is the equivalent of under two threads over two threads, you see, so that I have the opposite, the weft taking the opposite pass on this second pass than it did on the first pass of the needle weaving. Now let's move back where I've done a third pass of needle weaving along. Again, we still see the loops, we still see the warp down here. Let's come back a little further. And now, um, this is an area I'm satisfied that I've got enough needle weaving in. There, some of the loops which are a little longer are a little generous maybe, but the needle weaving covers the warp now down here in the cloth. And I think that's imminently satisfactory. Now the weaving is done, I'm going to take off the tension, take off the tie bar at the back, and pull the dupes and the cloth through the loom forward to the bench at the front here. And then I'll start removing the dupes. Now I'm taking out the dupes. Just about all the dupes are off. I found it much easier in working with them if I pull them through the heddles and have them loose like this and then take them from the, trace them back to the loop, it's, to the uh, loop of warp itself rather than working out here with these ends even though I've sometimes organized them in a very tidy manner, it tends to be quicker until you get down to the end. Just working them this way. I'm working them in pairs of two so that when I return them to this frame they've been on, I can keep them in the cross, and I always remember which side of the cross to do first if I work them in pairs. I'll take it off the other end, the breast beam end. What I'm going to do here is cut the fine Dacron that's binding the cloth now to this wrapped tie rod. And I'm making snips just about every inch. These are where the knots connected the beginning and the end of the warp to the warping frame. And I doubled them back, if you remember, and tensioned them and then wove them double here in this, inside the salvage. So I'm going to snip them off just very close here without getting any weft. Same story over here. Now this, if you remember, at one point during the warping process, I wanted to show how I added on a new strand. And this is the two strands which were overlapped quite a bit in the tunnel that the warp moves in. Now I'm going to cut each of them off. That meant that instead of having two strands in the warp tunnel at that point, I had three. Okay, here's the end of my weft that I ran back in. Now I might mention 
that this is my loom waist aside from the twining across at the end. This is the com completion end. These are the warps from the card woven selvages um, and I've taken the cards off. I'm going to take now and separate the threads from one card. All right, I'm going to take the, the thread that's furthest back here in the cloth and thread it on a needle. Put it through the first loop here. Ideally, I get clearly bisect the loop and not any of the weft. All right, I'm going to take the, the thread that's furthest back here in the cloth and I will go in the second loop and pull that up. And now I will take the third and final thread in this row of three strand twining When I lay the needle down, I bring the yarn up above the other needles, and when I take out, I take out on the other side. Do you see that? Show it to you again here. That's what allows the, t the twining to go on. I bring the thread around away from me and bring the new needle out to work near me with its yarns. Now, I want you to get a sense of the elasticity or give of the cloth before the twining and afterwards. This gives a firmness without drawing it in. And you can see as we've gone along a little more, the loops are covered much more satisfactorily along here. Um, I haven't shown you what the rug looks like yet, have also not shown myself. What I found is, if I'm going to be able to twine right away, I much prefer really not to look at it until I have that done. It somehow has such a different sense of presence and finish about it that it's a little bit like seeing a bride all decked out in her finery and ready almost ready to go down the aisle, but for the fact that she still has the curlers in her hair. And um, that's a small part of her outfit. It's a small part of her costume, but it totally alters her presence. Now we have the whole first row of twining done across. You can see it looks a little rattier on the underside than it does up here. On the whole, it's beginning to show a more even edge than we had before we twined. And peeking way down here under the folds of the rug is the beginning where we twined across right after we warped. It's a little trickier doing this row because it's a little bit harder finding the loops. Now, Sometimes you can't quite see what you're aiming for. You have to probe a little bit, and you have to get a sense of what those loops look like in there and where they will be. And one big clue in telling you has to do with the rep lines here at the end from the needle weaving. It definitely gets easier as you your eye and your finger get a little more accustomed to knowing where they need to be.
Now that's what it's looking like in its finished form. Here's the finished rug. It's a wedge weave. And I want to show you several features, point out things which I mentioned in the process of weaving so that you can see how little or much they show in the finished product. This is the twining at the beginning. I'll turn it so you can see it a little better on edge. And just above it is the basket weave. It shows up particularly well in this bit of orange here where it intrudes into the turquoise and the dark. And you might notice where the twining curves, bends around the corner, and becomes card weaving. All right? Now, it was relatively uneventful doing the weaving until we got up here to where um, we were really very close to the end. And there was this large disparity between the width at the right edge and at the left edge. And you can see, although it's really quite subtle, the horizontal stripes of weaving across here. Now, I must say, it felt much more as though this were really going to show a lot when we got to that point and did it. And it just fits in at this point in time. And here is the needle weaving across at the top here. And you might notice that the final twining is not in a straight line, but reflects individual warp disparity at the top there. Sometimes there's more of it. Sometimes there's less of it uh, from one rug to another. And uh, generally, this twining at the end helps camouflage that disparity a bit. Not in the sense of hiding it, but of making it flow. You may wonder why I weave for selvage when it takes a little extra time and a little extra skill. Now, I like challenges, for one, but it changes my role substantially from being one of planning out something and weaving it and having it turn out pretty much the way I want where everything succumbs to my predetermined design and becoming a collaborator in the process so that the net result is, in effect, a journal of the weaving of a particular piece um, and a, a testimonial to what happened during that piece, including some of the difficulties, uh, as opposed to negating the process of weaving and simply representing an idea captured in the cloth. I like the idea of becoming a collaborator. It seems less arbitrary, less self-conscious and egotistical, and less contrived. And it feels more as though um, it's a genuine dialogue between the weaver, the loom, and the cloth. And so that's why I weave for salvage.